Yes, welcome everyone. So I'm very happy to introduce Michael Post today. He's a professor at the University of Montpellier. Uh, he's one of the senior research fellows at the CNRS. Um, and also he's founding manager of the um, uh, founding managing editor of the Open Journal of Mathematical Optimization. Uh, so he's contributing a lot for open science. Um, and I'm very happy to have him here. Please, Michael. Thank you, Yanis. So thank you, Yanis and Reza, for giving me the opportunity of speaking about this recent work of mine with my colleague, Jérémy Amer, who's from Rennes University. Um, so I'm going to present part of this work. So the preprint is available online as well. You can, you can have a look later if you wish. So we will look at some variant of robust optimization problems. So here I have the definition for um, arbitrary robust combinatorial optimization problem with a linear objective function. So you see that the objective function is a product between C and Y. And we have the feasibility set Y that may contain any uh, any problem, any solution you wish. So Y, for instance, could be a um, set of trees in a graph, a set of item, uh, set of set of items that could fit within an knapsack or path in a graph. So here we have a nominal problem, so everything is known. And one of the extensions that we will know here is the robust counterpart. So now we assume for keeping the presentation simple, we will assume budget uncertainty throughout. I will tell you how it generalizes to marginal uncertainty later. So we assume that we have two values for each item, the nominal value C and the deviation D. And then the classical min-max robust counterpart is this one here. So we look for a solution Y um, that is good in the worst case. So given a Y, the true cost of Y is the maximum of delta in this set delta of this function here. And so the set delta models the fact that up to gamma uh, component of the small delta will be equal to one, the other being equal to zero. This is in an extreme point. Then you take the convex of that, you get this polydron, uh, this polytop here. Okay, so this is classical min-max robust optimization, where y is uh, therefore um, uh, a set that contains binary vector, and delta is the poly top polyhedral uncertainty set. Okay, we all know that problem. So the problem that we study in this work is slightly more complex. So it uh, models the fact that before uh, choosing your solution y, now you may investigate the uncertain parameters. So you may query Q component, for instance, of the cost vector. So the problem is now multi-stage in the sense that first you query uh, some of the component of the cost vector, then you get the result of this query, then you choose the solution Y that is of interest to you, and then uh, the remaining uncertainty is revealed. And you get this min-max, min-max structure, which is formally uh, stating what I just said. So first, uh, you query some of the component of the cost vector with the little w. Then you get some uh, response. You get uh, the, realized, the real, realized value for the component that you queried. Then you choose the solution that you wish. And then uh, the remaining component must reveal themselves. And you get eventually this cost here for your solution y. OK? So for instance, the set W could uh, model the fact that you may ask a Q question, but you, you could have a much more complex set if you wish. And the notation delta of W and uh, delta bar means that uh, the second stage revealing has to be consistent with what had been revealed in the first stage. So this simply means that if uh, the adversary had given you some value delta bar for some component of W that you had set to one, then the value of delta has to be equal to the value of delta bar that has been revealed to you before. OK, so this is the basic definition of the problem. Any questions so far, or is that clear? OK, so I assume that this is clear. Uh, maybe, for... maybe one question. So the 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 delta bar is can be contained in the whole budgeted set, but it's somehow related to W normally, right? Yeah, there are many deficient that end up to be equivalent. Uh, delta bar will reveal to the component 
to the component of W that you have investigated. Otherwise, it's not interesting for the adversary. But, uh, but there are many definitions that end up to be equivalent. Uh, in practice, you can really think of the fact that delta bar will belong to the projection of delta on uh, the component that you have investigated with W. Yeah, OK. Anyway, we'll, uh, we will talk more about this, this type of formulation later in the talk. So this type of model has plenty of application. Actually, if you're interested about them in the paper of Phoebe Vianos and co-author, there are many applications that are well detailed in, in that paper. So one, one type of application would be organ transplant because so in those problems you have in, in this problem you have a graph and each node in that graph is actually a pair of donor and receiver. So the donor gives an organ and the receiver gets the organ. And typically, you want to find small cycles or short paths in this graph. Um, a path represents the fact that you have an altruistic donor. And so you want to find a, to cover the nodes of that graph with a lots of uh, small cycles and small paths. And typically, in that problem, the compatibility between the donor and the receiver is not known in advance, and this involves lots of uh, medical um, investigation, and that is very costly. So you would like to carry out some of those investigations, but not too many of them. And so this is uh, naturally a two-stage uh, DDID problem. Another um, range of application would be in a city where you wish to build some, some uh, underground uh, facilities, like a subway or whatever. And uh, the problem is that city has been evolving along many years, and you don't know exactly what's below the ground. So you don't know exactly the cost of uh, carrying out those, those works. So you may want to investigate uh, some part of the underground of the city to know where it's more efficient to build your facilities. So uh, I gave some reference for more details about those applications, but there are many more. Also, from a more methodological viewpoint, uh, there are essentially two papers on, on this work. So first, the paper that I mentioned already by Phoebe Vianos and co-author. So they introduce and motivate the problem very nicely. They propose a key adaptability heuristic reformulation for the problem. And then they provide some numerical results on, on a rather simple structure Y. But they have a quite fancy uncertainty set called the factor model. And uh, in a more recent paper by Rosario Paradiso and co-author, they have a different algorithm that is exact. It's based on Bender's combinatorial branch and cut. In addition to that, they provide some key adaptability improvement, and they provide results for a, a more complex combinatorial problem related to routing problem. I will compare to those papers in my uh, numerical result anyway. So let us first look at some uh, sim very simple case to better get a grasp on the problem. So we have defined the min-max problem already, which is a classical robust counterpart. So let us define the wait and see counterpart, where you assume that you can take your decision Y after the adversary has revealed um, the uncertain parameter. So this is a, like a perfect information model. So of course, uh, this is better. You you get a better cost by doing that uh, by than by solving the true robust problem. And uh, this is um, uh, formalized here by the this inequality. So the optimal solution of the wait and see is always uh, cheaper than the optimal solution of the min max, and you can prove that simply by uh, permuting the min and the max. But intuitively, it's clear because the wait and see you have perfect information, so you take the decision after. Delta is known, while here you have to take your decision Y, and you still don't know what is the value of delta that we realize. So this leads to very simple bounds. So if you cannot observe any of the component of delta, then of course you cannot investigate anything about your uncertainty. The min max min max fall down to a min max problem. If at the contrary you can observe everything, then the min max min max is equivalent to wait and see problem. But in general, of course. The DID problem, which is a problem we study here, lies somewhere between the two, uh, those two simple bounds. Okay. Another simple but interesting observation is the fact that if the set Y is not a discrete set, but if instead it's a polytop, so there is no discrete decision, then you can actually uh, swap the min and the max here because everything is, is linear in the delta and in y and uh, the feasibility set are, are, are polytopes. So because of that, 
you get that the, the previous inequality become equalities, and you get that actually weight and C is equal to min max, and also that the DISD is not interesting. So this is the first interesting observation. If you have not discrete uh, choices in your model, then uh, the, the, the robust counterpart, the new robust counterpart provides nothing new comparison to what uh, exists already. Another simple but interesting observation is the fact that every time that you investigate one of the components of uh, delta, you reduce, you kind of reduce the dim dimension of the uncertainty set. You kind of project your uncertainty set on a hyperplane that is uh, defined by the component that you have investigated with uh, W. So if you investigate enough component, you will reduce the dimension of the uncertainty set to a point. So this uh, proposition here, what does it say? It says simply that if the dimension of uh, it says here that if the dimension of the uncertainty set is smaller than the number of queries, then you will reduce the uncertainty set to a point, meaning that you have investigated everything before you have to take your decision why. Therefore, uh, the DID is as efficient as wait and see. So if you allow to investigate enough component of the uncertain vector, uh, then you know everything before taking a decision, and then the problem is kind of relatively easy in, uh, to solve. And that's important because in our result also, we, we might mention that again. Okay, so th those were uh, rather simple observations just to get a first grasp on the problem. Um, and now I'll move to the main result that we have proposed in this work, which is a compact reformulation for the problem. So, yeah, so. As I said before, the two previous work for this problem, one was based on care adaptability and another one was based on combinatorial Bender's algorithm. And we all know combinatorial Bender's algorithm is, is a good idea, but it's kind of blind because it provides very weak cuts. So what we re propose is much stronger as you will see. Okay, so for the sake of clarity, I will use some uh, color scheme, which I hope will help you to, to understand what I'm doing. So I just, rewrote everything as before, but I added color to uh, pair the decision variables with their optimization level. So in black, I kept the W, the red for the first reaction of the adversary. In blue, that is the solution that we can choose. And in brown, this is the, the eventual reaction of the adversary. And we, we have the budget uncertainty here, again, to simplify the exposure. So first, the question to see if you're still alive. Any idea how we can solve the following problem just. So just the innermost maximization problem. Is that easy? Is that hard? So if I were giving a real seminar, I will stop here, but I will not do it because it's on online. But if you just forget about this notation because this is not well defined here, so let's just remove the dependency of W and, and delta bar. So just the maximization of the delta. So this is the innermost maximization problem. So Y is fixed. So the only variable is delta. This is a linear function of delta. So this is just maximizing over this simplex here. So this is actually just, you just solve it by sorting the coefficient of delta. So the coefficient of delta is given by uh, di di plus, uh, sorry, di times yi. And you just take the largest gamma uh, coefficient of delta. Okay, so you all agree that this is an easy problem that could, you can solve in n log n just uh, by using a sorting algorithm, okay? So that was the innermost maximization problem. So if we take one more level, is that problem hard to solve? So again, let's hide the W and the delta bar here because we don't really know what they mean. So is that problem hard, easy? So this is a min-max robust optimization problem. So this is uh, NP-hard in general. But because we have this very simple uh, budget uncertainty set, there is a famous result that tells us that this, this is an easy problem, actually, the min max problem. So uh, I will rely on this. So let me tell you again how this result works. Essentially, we replace the min max problem here by a min min problem here. OK, so we have, as before, we have the minimization of uh, the y. But the maximization of the delta has been changed by a minimization of the l. And L is now maximized, uh, minimized over simply N element. So this is simply an enumeration. You can enumerate over L, and then for each value of L, 
you solve the problem over y. So this is a very famous result that tells us that this min max problem can be solved by solving n problem, uh, n minimization problem here. Okay. Actually, there is a there should be n plus one, but it's a detail. Okay, so that's an easy problem. And so what about this, this problem? The max min max. Is that easy, hard? So this one is actually happens to be easy, but that's that's what we prove. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna discuss with you for the next couple of minutes. I will show you that this function phi of w, which is defined. So phi of w is the cost you get once you have investigated w. So it hides everything uh, once you have investigated w. And this is defined by max over the first reaction. You take a decision y, and there is a second reaction here. And so we will prove that this, the only result that we present here today is that you, we have a compact linear programming formulation for phi. And this uh, compact linear programming formulation for phi requires two assumptions. On, on the one hand, we want y to contain only binary vector. And on the other hand, and this is very important, we want that the convex hull of y is a compact polytope. It's a polytope that we know and that's rather small uh, in terms of number of inequalities. And uh, I will tell you later that actually the fact that I'm considering so far only budget uncertainty is not a restriction. We can generalize everything to uh, arbitrary polytopes. I will tell you later how we do that. So let me again insist on those assumptions here. So this is not very much of an assumption because that's what we have been uh, doing with so far. It's, we deal with a uh, combinatorial problem. So this is what we expect. This is a very strong assumption. We want uh, to have a, com a compact description for the convex hull of feasibility points. So typically, we can only handle a polynomially uh, solvable optimization problem that way. So for instance, uh, we cannot solve the knapsack that way because uh, the convex hull is very large, but we might solve the shortest path or the spanning tree or the selection problem. I will tell you later how we can relax this uh, assumption, but it's not uh, it's not for free. Okay, so I hope you still follow me. So now let's try to get this compact formulation for phi of W. So first we will simplify a little bit the notation because this uh, delta of W and delta bar is a bit uh, confusing. So just for the sake of the presentation, we replace this uh, weird notation by a simple delta bar here that is defined here. So it's a simple budget uncertainty set. The only difference is that the budget has been modified by some stuff that depends on delta bar. That's why gamma is in red. It's because it actually depends finally on delta bar. And also you see that the new C bar is in red. It's because it also depends finally on delta bar. I don't tell you how I do that, but it's not very hard to do. And you also get a new D bar here, but this one is independent of delta bar. Okay, so everything here that is in red are, uh, so this guy here and this one here essentially depend uh, affinely on delta bar. Okay, so first, the first step in our reformulation is to get rid of the outermost, uh, sorry, innermost maximization problem. And uh, we do, uh, no, <laughs> I got confused, the outermost one, sorry. So, and we do that by uh, using a trick that's well known in our community. It's called the epigraphic reformulation. So we introduce a new variable omega and say that omega has to be smaller than the min max problem. Uh, and that's all. And uh, we also have this variable uh, delta bar that is maximized over. So we have two types of constraints. We have this constraint here and those constraints here, but we leave them aside for a moment. Okay. So this is a well-known reformulation. So the second step now is that we have this min-max problem here. As I told you before, delta bar is essentially a budget uncertainty set, but the budget depends on, on delta bar. So we can use the result that I recalled earlier, and we can replace this min-max problem here by the min-min problem that I recalled earlier. Okay. So this is uh, simply an application of the well-known result from uh, Melvin and uh, Dimitris. 
And so here we have the gamma that depends on delta bar. That's one of the variables here. And C bar also depends on delta bar. OK, so here we have something uh, that, that is twice nonlinear. So we will try to handle it. So first, we handle this nonlinearity here. That's very easy, right? We just want omega to be smaller than the minimum over L. So we simply say that omega has to be smaller than each of these constraints. So we just have uh, n plus 1 constraint. This notation here means that uh, this set contains from 0 to n. OK? OK, so we have this maximization, this, this problem here, which is thin nonlinear because of the minimization here. OK, so uh, just uh, to insist, so far I have used one of my assumptions because to use this result here, replace the min max by the min min, I assumed that y was binary because this famous result applies only when y is binary. There are some extensions when y is integer, but that's not the topic of today. So we have this problem here with the minimization here that we dislike. Uh, well, now there is a second assumption that we have a, a description for the convex hull of, of Y here. And it, this minimizing over Y is the same as minimizing over its convex hull because the function here is affine in Y. So because uh, I know it's convex hull, I can replace this by an LP and I can dualize the LP, right? So this is what is written here. I have dualized over the polytop, the linear program defined over the polytop Y. And I got a bunch of dual variables that are represented by lambda and pi. And the matrix B and the vector B, those are the, the, par the parameters that we're describing this set here. OK. Uh, Michael, one question. Please. I'm a bit confused because you are maximizing over delta bar, but there's no delta bar appearing anymore. Yes, there is a delta bar here. In, this, in the C bar and in the gamma. Ah, yeah, this ah, flashed, yeah. Okay. Think. Okay. So that's what everything that is read for now is kind of the outermost maximization problem. But it was hidden indeed. OK, so now that we have this reformulation here, we, we still have a nonlinearity. We still have omega that has to be smaller than some maximization problem. But if you have a if you know the dualization result in robust optimization, you know that you can actually remove the maximization here. It doesn't change anything. So uh, said quickly, if you, have, if, you, if you know that the maximum here is greater than uh, omega, then it means that there is some lambda and pi that is greater than omega, so it's fine. And reversely, if there is some pi and lambda that is greater than an omega, then of course the maximum will also be greater than omega. So th this was a five second proof of a result that we all know. So I'm there actually. I have a compact a linear programming formulation for phi of w. Okay. So everything is affine in delta bar. So here we have delta bar that is hid hidden. Here we have a delta bar that is hidden, and then we have the dual variable lambda and pi. So that's one of the main results that we got. And now if you want to solve the original problem, so the original problem we wanted to minimize phi over w. So recall that phi now has this formulation that I just told you. So this is just the formulation here. I plugged it into this guy here, and I got this min-max problem that this is the problem that I want to solve. So what can I do again? Well, delta is a polytop. All these are linear constraints that are affine in, uh, in delta bar. So I can dualize a maximization problem. So I want, uh, I mean, it's not a very hard exercise. You can dualize the maximization problem. Then you get lots of product be between, between uh, the W and the dual variables. And if you linearize all that, you get this compact formulation for the min max, min max problem that we had initially. Okay? So this is a compact MILP formulation for the uh, decision dependent information discovery problem that we had initially. Um, it has not been. Michael, M. can I ask you a question? Of course, of course. Now, can you go to the previous slide? Yes. 
Um, so uh, don't you now split the uncertainty over more constraints? Is that not a problem here? I don't see what you mean. Uh, there is because no... we know you have um, more constraints eh, in, in, in uh, the delta bar. So, yeah, I mean, this this here should really be below. So it's just uh, just uh, the fact that delta has to belong to delta. And these are, you can, you can think of all those constraints, so these and this one, as kind of defining the new uncertainty set, if you wish. Mm -hmm. You can think of it as a classical min-max robust problem, but the uncertainty set is much more complex because it has the constraint of delta plus those constraints here, plus many variables, which are lambda and pi. I see, I see. Okay. So it's, it's really a classical min-max min -max, uh, problem, but uh, the, the, set if, the set involved in the maximization is a more complex polyhedron than those we are usually handling. I see, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your question. So this is what we get. So, uh, so I was about to tell you that there is no big M, which is a half light because this constraint is actually quite weak. So this formulation is, is not that bad, but it's still quite weak. And I will not uh, give you too much detail, but you can actually strengthen it significantly by introducing more variables. Essentially, you will, yeah, the main idea be below, below the strengthened formulation is that you kind of project a variable u and y on the investigated non-investigated component of w. It's a bit more technical. I will skip it for, for now. But if you do that, you get a very, very strong formulation as we showed you in the numerical result. OK, so this is one of the main results that we obtain. As I told you before, so far, I have assumed that we, we were handling with uh, the budget uncertainty set because uh, I felt it was a bit easier to present. But everything that I presented applies to a very general polytope. So assume that here we have a very general polytope. Uh, I split the constraints to two types of constraints. These are the coupling constraints. So typically, the budget constraint in uh, budget uncertainty. And those are just simply bound constraints. And we denote by L the number of row in the coupling constraint. So typically in budget uncertainty, L is equal to one. We have, we have just one coupling constraint. And so what you can prove is uh, that you can, for a general min-max problem, defined over this very general uncertainty set here, uh, you can also reformulate it as a min-min problem. But instead of having uh, simply n, so typically, normally, when you do that, the minimization of a involve n plus one different problem. Here, the alpha, it lives in a set that can be quite large. So if you have a large number of coupling constraints in your uncertainty set, then you typically have a la very large number of, of value alpha to enumerate here. OK, but if L is constant, so if L is equal to 1 or 2, 1 is the budget uncertainty, 2 would be kind of an extension of the budget uncertainty. Uh, this number is still moderated. And so if you plug this result, essentially, if in all what I have presented you so far, you get a reformulation that is valid for any uh, polyhedral uncertainty set. How, however, the size of the formulation will be uh, polynomially bounded only if L is constant. If uh, said differently, the size of the reformulation that I would get for a general uncertainty set would be exponential in L. Okay, so it will work only if we have uh, uncertainty polytopes that are not too complex in that sense. So this this is nice because it generalizes the result that I just present. It's also nice for some something completely unrelated because it answers a question that that I felt was open for some time. I'm not. Sure. I hope uh, other people felt the same. So this is a question. So if you have a nominal problem, uh, this is the classical min-max robust counterpart. So forget about the DID for an instant, just the classical min-max robust counterpart of this minimization problem. As I said in my introduction, it, it is well known that the min-max counterpart of a minimization problem is NP-hard in general if L is part of the input. This is uh, this follows from very classical results in robust combinatorial optimization. 
And until we proved this, actually, it was not completely clear what happens when L was constant. So in the previous work, uh, I kind of partly answered this, but now this is very neatly answered. So if L is constant, and if this problem is easy, then the counterpart is essentially easy. And if L is not constant, then the, but that, that, that was new before, then the counterpart is hard. So this result is really kind of the best you can hope for for a general poly, polytope. It tells you that either the polytope has a, a small number of coupling constraints and then introduction of robustness is not too complex, or the polytope has many coupling constraints, and that and then we knew already that there was no hope to obtain very efficient reformulation. So this is one extension. Another extension that I wanted to tell you is uh, what if we want to consider a more complex problem for which the convex hull uh, is equal also to a polytope, but a polytope that is too large to, to be described. Uh, for instance, the shortest path or the, the Steiner tree or whatever. So I just give you the main idea of what we can do in those cases. One idea is to consider the convex hull uh, of Y and do kind of colon generation. So we will try to enumerate the extreme point of the convex hull of Y as we do in colon generation. And, in, by, and we will solve a sequence of MILP problem. Uh, no, no, it's not very true. We'll solve a MILP problem whose size will increase in the, in the course of the resol uh, resolution. So typically, this is a colon generation algorithm. So this is very similar to what people do when, when they have uh, when they apply branching price and colon generation. I won't give you too much details on that. It's in the paper. If you wish to know, I will just tell you, uh, give you some numerical experiment showing that this is uh, uh, this is likely to work efficiently. Another idea is to do cutting plane. So essentially you start with another approximation of the convex hull. And then if you're not, uh, if by solving a problem over P1, you didn't get the solution to the original problem, which is likely, you add some cuts and you get a tighter and tighter formulation of convex of Y. So this, I think, is less uh, practically relevant because it's very hard to have those uh, cutting plane algorithms converge uh, alone. However, I will show you an illustration of that for a polynomial problem. So you will see there is some interest in that approach as well. So let me now illustrate what I had in mind before. So first, I will just illustrate the compact reformulation on the selection problem. So the selection problem, in that case, uh, I know the convex hull of Y is very easy. It just has a one constraint plus bounds. I mean, uh, so Y is now. And I take the selection problem because it had been uh, introduced previously uh, by Phoebe Vianas and co-authors. Um, so we we essentially coded their uh, key adaptability heuristic following their paper. Uh, I should mention that in their, their paper is, is more general than ours because in our case, we still uh, require that the number of coupling constraints is, is low. So we actually, we use budget uncertainty. So we have only one coupling constraint. And uh, whereas their approach uh, does not grow exponentially in the number of coupling constraints. Okay, so that, that is a result that we obtain by using their approach on budget uncertainty. So you see that uh, for 15 items, for instance, uh, the solution time is nearly one hour uh, when k is equal to three, when you do three adaptability. Okay, so with 10, uh, 10 items, it's half a, half a minute. So it, the, the solution time really blows up as, as soon as the number of items increase and you, you wish three ad adaptability. And this is partly due to the very weak uh, uh, gap of the formulation. And so this is the result that we obtain. So it's it's orders of magnitude faster, right? So uh, so the, the 15 item, they could solve it in less than one hour. And so 20 item, we solve it in 10 seconds. And 50 item, we solve it in uh, three minutes. And actually, we could solve like 200 items in uh, two or three minutes, if I remember well. So this is very, very, very much faster. But as I said before, our approach really relies on the number of coupling constraints. Here we have only one. Probably if we had two or three, it would still scale. But 
uh, it would not scale for any any polytop. Okay, and uh, so the good solution time that we obtain are also due to the very very low gaps, and those gaps are, are due of the uh, strength and uh, formulation that I told you before. The original formulation has a gap that is about four or five percent. It's still much faster than this, but uh, much much lower than this. So now we we can we assess our colon generation heuristic on a problem that is NP hard. So essentially, in this case, Y contains elementary paths in a graph, so paths without cycles, and there is a maximum time constraint as well. So this is the algorithm from the literature. So as I said before, it's a combinatorial Bender's uh, cut algorithm that involves also some constraint and colon generation. And what we do is a colon generation at the root node of the branch and boundary. We add colon, add colon, add colon, add colon, and then we start a branch and boundary with a colon that we have generated at the root node. So it means it, our approach here, it's a heuristic because to be exact, we should do branch and, branch and price which is some more work. So a student of, of ours is currently doing that. But so I will show you how our heuristic works. So these are the instances provided by uh, Rosario and co-authors. We thank them for that. So essentially, the small instances, they can solve them, all of them. And the largest one, they can solve like half of them. OK? And it takes them uh, like a uh, couple of minutes for the solved instance on the largest one. This, the time is hard to evaluate because many of the instances are not solved to optimality. In any case, our heuristic for all those instances, it runs in less than three or four minutes. And this is the gap of the best solution we find compared to the optimal solution. No, not the optimal solution, the best solution they find. So for the small problem, we have a positive gap, meaning that our algorithm is indeed a heuristic, so it, is, it did not return the optimal solution, and but it's very close to the optimal solution. So you see a gap of 0.2%, it's very, very small. So it's a very good heuristic apparently. And for the largest problem, we see that the best solution we find is better than the best solution they found. And this is because the algorithm could not converge to the optimal solution. So we found a better solution that they did. Okay, and in quite short of amount of time. So this seems to indicate that the heuristic is quite good and we should work on the branch and price extension to make it exact, but that's some more work. And the last uh, experiment is to uh, illustrate the interest of the cutting plane algorithm. So we assess it on the spanning tree problem. So this is a polynomially solvable problem, but the compact formulation is quite large. It's required multi-commodity flow formulation. So we can apply the compact formulation that I showed you before, but it's quite large. Alternatively, we could use a formulation that is not exact based on the sub two formulation. Uh, sorry, that is not exact. Uh, it's not described. Uh, uh, yeah, it is actually the sub two formulation, but with not all sub two are included because there are exponentially many sub two uh, inequalities. So we will generate uh, generate the sub two inequalities on the fly within a classical branch and cut algorithm. So in this case, here CP is an exact algorithm. Compact is an exact algorithm. This is a simple, uh, straightforward implementation of the formulation. And this is a branching cut algorithm. So those are spanning tree instances take, uh, taken from internet. They have up to like 50 nodes and 200 edges. And what you see here is that using a CP algorithm, a branching cut algorithm is much more efficient actually, because uh, I just realized, no, I don't remember. I think we ran out of memory actually for those larger here. So we could solve the instance much larger by using this cutting plane generation. And you see here that we have a hundreds of cuts generated depending on the instance. In this case, we have no cut generated because the initial constraint were strong enough for the problem. Okay, so uh, that's all I wanted to say scientifically, but then I will bother you a little bit, so don't, don't cut me. So to, to recap, uh, there is two main contrib contributions in this work. First one is, uh, as I told you before, in extending, uh, we, we have extended the result of uh, Melvin and Dimitris. And essentially, we show that uh, min-max is not harder than uh, minimization when the number of coupling constraints is constant in a polyhedral uncertainty set. But that's kind of a side contribution of our work. The main contribution is when um, the, the convex hull of uh, the feasibility solution is a compact polytope, 
and L is constant, then uh, computing phi, so phi was the function that was telling us the cost of W, a given W, so computing phi is an LP, and solving the whole, uh, the whole uh, DDID problem is a compact MILP. So there are many questions that are still left open for that problem. So complexity-wise, uh, we could not prove uh, that very simple variant of DDID are LP hard. Uh, so even if you have the selection problem, for instance, we don't know whether the problem is NP hard. And numerically wise, uh, the current generation algorithm is quite promising, but still we have to do some coding to, to, uh, to see how it uh, behaves. So I will just steal a couple of more minutes of your time, as I always do when I give a presentation. Sorry about that, because I think it's important. Um, so I will just uh, talk to you a little bit about the publishing system. For those of you who know everything about it, you can just uh, leave now. But for those who are interested, you can stay. It will just be uh, two, three minutes. So as we all know, uh, publication was expensive back in the days. It was difficult to do. And we are very much grateful to the publishing uh, houses that uh, helped uh, uh, disseminating science uh, three or 400 years ago. But we're not really in that time anymore. So we now publish online, preprint are published on the net. Nobody uh, reads uh, books of uh, papers anymore. And you can use LaTeX to, uh, to provide the, an early final version of, of your paper. So everything is very cheap now, very easy to do. So as a consequence, as we all know, Everybody, everyone has access now to all paper for free and uh, because that's how it should be, right? Producing science is, I mean, disseminating science is free, so that's how it should be. Well, we all know it's not the case. And unfortunately, uh, most paper are not uh, in uh, open access. And when they are, it's very expensive. And uh, actually, Elsevier is one of the most uh, profitable company in the world, uh, above Microsoft and Facebook. Uh, they have profit margin up around 40 percent um, well it's a good business for them uh, so for instance you know they ask sometimes they may ask you 2000 euro for having a paper published in open access and i mean i've been investigating that for a while the true cost of publishing a paper in open access varies between three euro and 800 euro so 800 euro is when people don't use that tech and we need to typeset their word uh, document and three euro that's the, uh, there is a journal, I forgot it, a journal of open source software. The, this is their running cost. This is a free open access journal. So well, I'm not the first to realize that the situation is a bit strange. So there are some people that are quite famous, like Tim Gores, who got the field medals in mathematics. I mean, there is no need to say it was mathematics. And so, well, uh, some years ago, he started an uprising, and he's not, he was not alone either. And essentially, what he and other people said is that, well, the submission and publication should not be conditional to the payment of a fee. And when there is a fee paid, it should be proportional to the amount of work carried out. So those are, in general, the fair open access principles. If you're interested to that, you can Google it. You will find them in details. The good news is that uh, there are not many uh, good journals uh, that are free. So for instance, uh, if you know machine learning, G GMLR is one of the best journal in machine learning. It's free. Jair is also one of the best journal in AI is free. There's the new journal TMLR. If you know a bit of theoretical computer science, they have many uh, high quality free uh, journals. Theoretics is a very recent one that's, that's free and that's extremely good. There are many conferences that for free. In mathematical optimization, it's a bit more complex. There are those two journals that are a bit more recent, and they try to do a good job. So actually, I'm involved with this one. So that's why I'm talking about all that. And so, yeah, we're trying to have a high-quality journal, which we seem to be doing so far. But we need, we need your papers, of course, to make it work. And about that, you still have a couple of weeks to, if you're interested, submit a paper to a, a special issue that's related to optimization at the second level. So optimization at the second level here means second year level of computational, computational hierarchy. Essentially, it means by level optimization or two-stage robust optimization or stuff like that. And so you still have a couple of weeks to uh, submit to that issue if you're interested. And uh, hopefully, you get something nice there as well. So now it's, I'm very open. Get back to the takeaway messages.